Hi everybody. We're going to get into what I think is a kind of a fun part of radiology because it's um, really looking and studying at the radiographs and trying to figure out um, what you're seeing as far as a diagnosis. Um, of course, a uh, diagnosis is what the dentist does, but um, we are really well trained to be able to identify and, and end up getting really good at um, identifying caries on radiographs. So let's begin. So the objectives define different classifications of caries, determine presence of caries and classification given the radiographs, identify the factors influencing caries interpretation, and define arrested caries, recurrent caries, and cervical burnout, and then um, distinguish between root caries and cervical burnout. So dental caries um, is basically the localized destruction of teeth by the microorganisms. So it's a bacterial infection of the um, hard structures of the tooth. Normal mineralized tooth structures like the enamel, the cementum, and the dentum is altered and destroyed by dental caries. So we need to carefully examine the oral cavity, the teeth, with our eyes, and then we also need to interpret radiographs. We really can't, um, can't do one without the other. So a dental examination cannot be considered complete without um, dental images because you just can't see everything with your eyes. There's just areas of the mouth that you're not going to be able to see unless you have a radiograph. So it allows the dental professional to identify curious lesions that are not visible clinically. So clinical tools that we use to detect uh, caries are, is the mirror and the light, um, the explorer, and then air, blowing air to dry off the tooth. Um, visual clues that caries are present um, could be dark staining in the grooves. When we dry off the tooth, kind of a chalky white spot um, indicates some demineralization. Sometimes there's no visible evidence of caries at all. Sometimes um, we, we really can't see what's beneath the surface and the caries has really gotten spread out and gotten big, but we don't actually see an opening or a big um, carious lesion with our eyes, but it shows up on the radiograph. So radiographic interpretation, interproximal caries found at or below the contact area. So here, right where the teeth are touching or below would be considered interproximal caries. So here or above, so apical to the contact. Clinical appearance of interproximal um, caries. So you can see here um, in between the two premolars here, you can see that it's real shadowy right here on the distal of um, whatever tooth number that is, if that's like, um, maybe that would be four, I think. Um, or actually that'd be five, it's hard to say. But anyways, um, the distal of this uh, premolar, you can see it's real shadowy and kind of dark. So you can see that with your eyes um, occlusal surfaces can show dark staining in the fissures and pits or can appear chalky too, um, but because you can see a little bit of staining here, um, but the interproximal part shows up real shadowy, kind of looks a little shadowy there as well. The appearance of caries on dental images can be classified according to their location. So they can be an occlusal caries, they can be an interproximal caries, they can be a buccal or a lingual caries, and then they can be a root surface caries. They can also be rampant, um, or they can be recurrent caries. And they can also, um, those um, types of caries can also be viewed on a radiograph. So secondary caries or recurrent caries occurs adjacent to a pre-existing restoration. So it's kind of like there was a cavity, they filled it, and now there's recurrent caries around the filling. So the caries has come back around a filling. The term rampant means growing or spreading unchecked. So rampant caries is advanced and severe caries that's just 
all over the place. It just affects numerous teeth. Rampant caries is typically seen in children with poor dietary habits or adults with decreased salivary flow. So radiographic interpretation, interproximal caries, incipient interproximal caries, or a class one, this is an example here, this little dark notch, it extends less than halfway through the thickness of the enamel. Oops, I was pointing to the wrong screen. So here's the little notch, and it extends less than halfway through the enamel. So that's class one. So you're just going to see a little tiny notch. And it may not be visible um, on a radiograph, or actually it may not be visible in, um, to the eyes. So this is something that you would pick up better on a radiograph than with your eyes clinically. Moderate interproximal caries is class two, and that extends more than halfway through the thickness of the enamel, but not quite to the DEJ. So it's still only in the enamel, but it's more than halfway. It has not reached the DEJ. So here's an example, the distal of 29. You can see it's just a little bit of a notch right there. And would we say that that is less than 50%? I would say it's just barely under 50%. So I would put this as a class one. So interproximal caries, advanced interproximal caries, or a class three, is um, caries that has gotten to the DEJ, gotten to the dentin, um, dento enamel junction, and it's into the dentin, but less than halfway to the pulp. Now, it kind of depends on where you're looking at it, because you can see this distance to the pulp in the dentin is much, much shorter than this distance to the pulp. So it kind of depends on the location, but in general, this area is not quite halfway to the pulp. Now, severe interproximal caries, or a class four, extends through the enamel, through the dentin, and is more than halfway to the distance to the pulp. So that's severe interproximal caries. So interproximal carious um, lesions, they always are larger than they appear on a radiograph. So if something looks like it's just barely through into the dentin, it probably is going deeper into the dentin than it appears on the radiograph. Or if something looks like it's just not quite halfway into the enamel, it probably is definitely halfway into the enamel. Um, so it always um, is larger than it appears on the radiograph. You cannot determine whether real cavity or just demineralization from a radiograph. So you might have a, an area that's like a class one or a class two, but it's just demineralized. Small lesions, class ones and class twos, they don't necessarily need to be restored. Some of them can be remineralized by using fluoride and improving the oral hygiene, reducing the number of acid attacks on the tooth. Um, so sometimes the doctor will say, if you improve your oral hygiene, if you um, kick up your fluoride, we can watch these little tiny incipient class one lesions and see if they um, get any bigger. Demineralized caries that um, demineralized caries called arrested caries if they have stopped it. So if if there's a carious lesion and it remineralizes, I think this might mean remineralized caries is called arrested caries because arrested means stopped. So um, so the caries process has stopped if you um, remineralize it. I think that's that is supposed to be remineralized. Um, let's see. So here's some examples. So between eight and nine, um, what classification? Well, it's clearly all the way through the enamel. You can see it into the dentin here. I would say it's about or maybe less than half um, of the way into the dentin there. So I would say this is probably a class three on this side. And this, uh, maybe a class three there too. Those are really, really a little bit hard to tell, but I would probably lean toward um, just barely still a class three. Then it says, is there calculus anywhere? So we haven't talked about this yet, but this little spur right here, 
on um, on this to this little triangular spur, that's a, what we call a spur of calculus. So that's what calculus looks like. Oops, there we go. There's a little circle of the calculus, and there's the inner proximal decay. So example number 12, distal. Um, what classification? And then is there calculus and where? So um, I think that a oh, number 12. So here is um, a really large cavity. You can see it's clearly all the way through the enamel. And then it's really quite large and it's getting very close to the pulp. So to me, this one would be a class four. And then can you see any calculus? So do you see any of those little triangular spurs on this um, on this x-ray, similar to what we saw in the last one? So there's the calculus. There's a little um, spur of calculus. And there's actually another really super teeny little one right down here on the mesial of um, 19. OK, so root caries is the last classification, and that's a class 5, and that's going to be um, down below the enamel on the cemento, cementum, um, and it usually occurs when there's recession. Um, a lot of times you'll see root caries in the older population, older adults, especially if they have a lot of recession and dry mouth, and their dexterity has um, is not so good and they have difficulty cleaning. So root caries or a class five is um, along the, the cervical um, portion of the tooth or the kind of the neck of the tooth. Um, also called cemental caries, radicular caries, and senile caries. So class five example on the distal of 20. You can see here it's pretty notched out there. So there's an example of a class five um, decay or class five caries. Buccal and lingual caries are difficult to distinguish on a radiograph. Um, it's, it's not super obvious, and a lot of times this would be, um, you know, if there's like a buccal or a lingual pit that there's caries, usually you would find that doing a clinical evaluation using an explorer. But for example, you can see a little radiolucent circle right here. So that is the caries there. A lot of times you can actually see it because it, I mean, if you can see it on a radiograph, it's going to look like a small radiolucent circle. Um, so you can kind of see one over here as well. But you can't always see them. So you have to, a lot of times, those have to be um, diagnosed from a clinical um, visual examination. It may be confused with occlusal caries, too, because sometimes it's hard to know where it's coming from. So occlusal caries, um, is, incipient is not pictured, and you can't see that. You can't see incipient occlusal caries on a radiograph because it would just be broken into the enamel. Just, oopsies, go back. It would just be right up here. It wouldn't have come into the dentin. You could see that maybe um, visually when you're looking at the tooth, especially if you see a chalkiness or a dark staining in occlusal group in the grooves, pits and fissures. Um, but usually you can't pick that up on a radiograph. Moderate will extend down into the dentin and appears as a thick radiolucent line. So you start to see more of a radiolucent line right underneath the enamel. Severe extends into the dentin, appears as large radiolucency, so it starts to fan out and spread out. And a lot of times there'll be a cavitation in the top of the tooth, like a hole in the top of the tooth. And so then um, you can see that it's starting to get a lot bigger. So here um, we have an example. This is pretty blurry, but um, example, what classifications? So if we look at if we look at number 20 first of all, since it's starting and we can see some um, distal right here, that this to me actually looks like a class two. It's kind of blurry, so it's hard to say where the caries ends. I would say that's like right at the edge of a class one, maybe just starting to be a class two. But you could I think I feel like you could probably go either way but that could be just at the end of a class one. 
Over here you see a tiny little notch on the uh, mesial of 20. That's probably closer to a class 1. Then on 19 mesial, um, you have the notch here, but then you can see some shadowing um, into the dentin as well. So this has reached the dentin, um, dento enamel junction and then gone into the dentin. So I think this is probably closer to a class 3 over here on the mesial of 19. Then we have this large occlusal caries. This is a large um, cavitation occlusal caries. And then on the distal of 19, this one goes into the enamel and then it, it kind of connects with this occlusal surface as well. So this looks pretty large. I would put this closer to a four. And then let's see, then if we look at, what's the other one, 14. So if we go up here, to the distal of 14. This is pretty large. You can see this large shadow right through here. So we have this broken through the enamel and then a large shadow. So I would put that at closer to a class four as well because we're probably more than halfway to the enamel or to the pulp, excuse me. So those are those one. Oh, and then I have circled. There we go. Okay, and then for this radiograph, um, 19 is um, an occlusal caries that's not super obvious in the enamel, but you see how it's shadowy down in here. So this to me um, is a fairly moderate, at least moderate um, occlusal caries. Because if we go back up here, extends, oh, I know I would put it closer to the, um, to the severe then, because it see how this goes about halfway to the pulp. It doesn't say that specifically, but if you look at the shadow down in here, this, this spreads out pretty broad, so I put that as severe. 21 over here, it comes through the occlusal of the premolar, and then it's a little bit less. This is probably closer to moderate for an occlusal caries. And then 14 up here, we have a little notch on the 14 mesial. It's probably, um, I, I would probably say that again, we're on the border of a one to two. It depends on if you think that that goes more than halfway. To me, it doesn't look like it's more than halfway. Well, actually it probably goes out to here. So yeah, that's probably is a class two. Some of these are hard to see when they're um, a little bit blurred out. But then the distal of, um, you can see a little shadowing on the distal of 13 as well, and that's probably incipient or a class one. Okay, so here the distal of 13, that definitely goes into the dentin. That would be closer to a class, that's a class three, not quite halfway to the pulp though. Mesial of 14, definitely through the enamel, into the dentin, that's also a class three. Um, if we come down to 18, the occlusal surface, you, you can kind of see a radiolucent line, but then a pretty large area underneath the enamel. So I would say that's probably pretty severe occlusal um, decay. And then 13 mesial, here we have, this is a class one, I would I don't know, I might even say closer to a class two. Um, a lot of times it, it, they're like right on the edge. Um, distal as well, I'd probably say closer to a class one there. Although that shadow is kind of right here. I think that's more like a two. And then 14 is a definite three. The shadow goes to, all the way to about here, which isn't quite more than halfway. So I would say that's probably a three, but getting very close to a four. And then on 20 mesial, we have recurrent decay down here under this amalgam. So here we have a big amalgam, and then you can see how it's notched out underneath the enamel, and it's shadowy. So we have a recurrent decay underneath this amalgam. And then also on 20, this radiolucent circle is more of a facial um, caries as well. So we have a caries, and that's hard because it can get confused with the pulp, but you can see how this circle is so much darker than the rest of the pulp. So that identifies a um, facial caries. So then here we have um, an example of root caries 
on 19, well, 19 over here and on 20. Um, and so those are um, pretty severe root caries, pretty large root caries, especially on the premolar because it gets, it's so much tinier in circumference, but gets to the pulp a lot closer. Those are a couple um, examples of root caries, and you can see this radiolucency down at the apex. So see how large this decay is and how close it is to the pulp? And then you can see that there's some pathology down here at the apex of the root. So this caries has gotten so big that it, the pulp is infected now. And now they have this, this um, periapical abscess. So now we're going to talk about something that is not caries, but can look like caries and get confused for caries. Um, it's called cervical burnout. And cervical burnout is a radiolucent artifact. So it's a dark, dark, shadowy artifact. Um, cervical burnout appears at the collar um, right below uh, the CEJ. And it's a collar-shaped or a wedge-shaped area between the CEJ and the alveolar bone. So it's gonna be above the level of the bone, but below the CEJ. So it's gonna hover right in this little area between the CEJ and the bone. The tissue at the CEJ is less dense than the region above or below it. So we kind of have this thinner area. You can see when we, if we do a cross section of a tooth, we have these um, mesial and um, distal root depressions. You're learning all about that in your um, root morphology and your tooth anatomy. Um, so it's, it's less dense through there. So as the radiograph takes the image, it goes, it goes through less material, so then you get this cervical burnout. The tissue at the CEJ is less dense than the region above or below it. Above the CEJ, the enamel cover is covered by the crown, so that gives it more density. So above the CEJ, we got enamel, so that gives us more density above it. Below this area, we have, we're into the bone, so the bone covers the root, and so that gives more density too. So there's like this little section of space where you can look in an x-ray and say, where does the CEJ go to? And then, and then where is the bone? And then if you see like this shadowy area in between those two sections, and the person has very low caries risk, they don't really have caries clinically that you can see, then you, can, you know that you're looking at cervical burnout. So let's look and see some um, examples of it. So, for example, here, the bone level stops about here. The CEJ is right here. And then we have this kind of shadowy area here and this little shadowy area here. We have a shadowy area through here. And again, over here. This one could really throw you. That really kind of looks like it carries right there. And a little shadowy area over here. So all these areas, but if you notice the bone level and the CEJ level, on all these areas, the shadowy area kind of is, is landing right in between those two spots, between the enamel and between the bone. So now we look at something like over here, where we have a pretty good notch. It's pretty well defined. It's not as diffuse. These kind of look a little bit more diffuse. But it's a pretty good notch. And yes, it's below the CEJ, but look where the bone level is. The bone level is way down here and we have this little notch. So this is a more of an example of root caries. So we got some root caries. And it kind of shows it here. So the, dif the, the caries will go up under the enamel on caries, but for cervical burnout, it'll just hang out right around the, um, right around the, the portion between the CEJ and the bone. That's why this one almost to me looks a little bit like decay, I have to admit, because see how this shadow kind of goes up underneath so I, I don't wonder if that isn't a little bit of decay. These ones, though, you can really see how it, it's just right in those, those spots, right between the, the um, bone and the CEJ. So another um, thing that shows up on radiographs um, that can be confusing for caries is cervical abrasion. So cervical abrasion is a notching out right at the gum line, um, right at the cervical region of the tooth. 
um, usually there's recession and then this notching. It's more well-defined than caries or burnout. And a lot of times it's spread across the whole, in the x-ray, it's spread across the whole part of the tooth from one side to the other. Usually it's due um, to toothbrush abrasion, or it can also be some kind of a parafunctional oral habit like clenching or grinding or um, biting repeatedly on a pipe or something hard. And it, um, it, that um, friction or that constant pressure um, actually ends up eroding the cervical portion of the tooth um, over time. But and they used to just call it toothbrush abrasion, but it can actually be caused by other things. You can see that the wear on this person's tooth um, on the top. So they have a lot of wear up here, and then they have all this cervical notching. So then on the radiograph, you can see these little radiolucent bands across the teeth, and that is, um, that's indicative of the of the cervical abrasion and not decay. You can see it's really kind of well defined. And then recurrent caries, so a radiolucency around the edge of a restoration. So here we have a restoration and then right along the edge we have kind of a shadowy mark. Um, again, here's a real life picture. We have a fairly, a little bit of an overhang here on this restoration and then underneath it, it's real shadowy. So probably this area was trapping bacteria and then over time it just um, recurrent decay um, happened underneath this. So maybe blocked by the shadow of the restoration, you might not always see re um, recurrent decay. So sometimes you don't actually see it until it's really big because it's, sh it's hidden from, from view fr with the restoration. And then by the time you do see it, it's sometimes really big, which is too bad, but that's, um, what can happen. So recurrent decay examples um, of bite wing with restoration, massive overhang. This is a massive piece of amalgam that um, didn't get, this margin is very irregular and a very large overhanging margin, which is horrible for the patient's oral hygiene. Um, and so then you get a very large recurrent decay. So then here it says any other areas of caries and wear. Um, so this is a very dark, this overall density of this film is very high, but you can see little notches right here in between 30 and 31. So those look to me like class one. And then between two and three, mm, caries, oh, up here, caries or cervical burnout. To me, I would say that this is probably more like cervical burnout because you can see it's ending right at the CEG and it's going to the bone. So it's like right in that area between the um, CEG and the bone. This one though is a little diffuse into the enamel, so that one is a little harder to tell, I think. But down here you can see how it's kind of shadowy here and here, so those are areas of cervical burnout. They're probably more likely to be cervical burnout. Enamel hypoplasia is another one that can show up that can look like decay on, um, on an uh, x-ray or a radiograph. You can kind of see this pitted look to the enamel and these little kind of, kind of thin shadowy mark, kind of pitting all in all these different little areas, kind of irregular pitted look here as well. So it can be confused with caries, but when you clinically examine the tooth, you can see like this one has a very mottled look to it. It's very pitted and it's not smooth and hard, like nice um, formed enamel. Um, and so once you've looked inside the mouth and then you um, look at the radiograph, it makes sense. So here, um, examples, any caries in these? Um, let's see if you look at this one, um, what does this look like to you? Does this look like a carious lesion here and here? This is actually an example of abrasion. You can see it's pretty well defined and it's going across the cervical area. So these, these are examples of abrasion. These are a little harder to tell here. I suppose there might be a little bit of caries coming in here on this canine. Maybe there's some recurrent decay underneath this crown, but these are pretty hard to tell. This is not a very good angle. I don't think. 
And then how about here, any carries in this image? The biggest one you can see is underneath this crown. There's a pretty large recurrent decay right under here. And that could also have been some root resorption too. This tooth had a root canal and a crown and sometimes um, you get internal resorption and external resorption or it could be, and the teeth are less resistant because when they have a root canal, they're not vital anymore. So they're even more resistant to decay. Um, so this one has something major happening underneath there, underneath that crown. And then as far as calculus goes, you can see these spurs, these, these large spurs here on the sides of the tooth. And then over here, over on um, the distal of six, you can see pretty big one, a little bit on four or five, I mean, a little bit on the distal there. And then even underneath here in this, this kind of shadow, kind of um, lighter radial loosen area. There's calculus here and here. It's all over the place. This person has lots of calculus. Something there, maybe. So how about caries on this image? Well, this is just a really horrible image to try and diagnose decay. So I would call this a very non-diagnostic non film. So it kind of gives you an illustration of the importance of having a good, um, a good film to diagnose from. All these overlaps, this very um, low density, it's, it's a very um, white washed out film. Um, everything is just sort of whitewashed and you can't really see. So this is a pretty bad diagnostic film. Here's, I just found this on the, um, when I Googled um, enamel hypoplasia, it just kind of gives another example of kind of a pitted look. You can see how kind of pitted and irregular, but you can see how you would think that that's decay. Um, but then in the mouth, you can see how there's a lot of thinned areas where there's enamel hypoplasia. So that's why you need kind of both the mouth and the radiograph to help you diagnose. So here's some more caries or cervical burnout. So this is um, more of a, a representation of cervical burnout because you can see it's right along the cervical edge. It's more diffuse. It's not real defined and it's right between the CEJ and the bone. Any calculus on this image? see some up here, there's calculus there, there's calculus there, calculus here. And a lot of times there's calc if there's all these places of calculus, there's definitely calculus here and here and here. You just might not see it radiographically, but a lot of times calculus is like, kind of like how we said in the beginning, a cavity is always bigger than what it looks like on the film. Calculus is always, there's always more calculus than what it looks like on a film as well. So. There's, if you see it here, you know you're going to have something over here and here. And practice makes perfect, so we'll just have more opportunity to practice those identifying and um, interpreting um, carious lesions on films um, in this week. All right. Thanks, guys.